Hey, welcome everyone to the From the Shadows podcast. I am your host, Shane Grove. And before we start this week's episode, I just want to remind everybody that if you want to check out all things From the Shadows podcast, you can go to our website, fromtheshadowspodcast.com. It has links to all of our social media, including our uh, Patreon page, our gift shop, our TikTok thing, you know, whatever that is. I mean, I'm not dancing on it, so whatever. Yeah, but I think Nita, our uh, social media queen, puts some cool stuff up there. If you want to follow me, you can find me at uh, Shane Grove Author on Instagram. You can send me a message there, or you can just find our contact button on our website. And if you have an experience that you want to tell us about and come on the show and share it, I'd love to hear from you. I uh, promise I'll read it and get back to you as soon as I can. So with that being said, I'm excited for this week's guests. Um, Leslie and Steve are here. They, yeah, they're waving. Everybody watching on YouTube, can they, <laughs> they're their way. Oh, <laughs> come in peace or pr- prosper. Is that what Live that? long and prosper. Peace and prosperity. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Yeah. All, the, all the Trekkies just yelled at me. Yeah. <laughs> but you got but you guys come actually nita found you guys our social media queen found you guys on instagram and said hey you got to check these guys out and you guys have written a book you got that i'm going to let you guys talk about and done a documentary which ironically one of the people involved in the documentary is friends with phil our producer here at the podcast so it's kind of like a small world when you get into it so introduce yourselves to our audience tell us tell us about the book and and what you guys have been experiencing all right um my name is leslie shaw and this is stephen shaw i was a journalist for 20 years and stephen was a tai chi master and a um acupuncturist he's retired acupuncturist now and a brilliant musician um we're kind of uh just ufo enthusiasts we don't have a degree in it or anything but we've been studying the phenomenon for decades and experiencing and steve's family have been experiencing uh what we believe is the alien abduction phenomenon going back many generations i'll about let him four, tell you about, about that generations of course <laughs> oh in yeah. the book uh the book is called who they are and what they're up to. And uh, in it, we tried to answer the questions, the big questions about UFOs. Who's flying them? What do they want? Why are they here? Kind of questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Steve, why, let's start with you sharing, you know, some of your family's history with with UFO abductions. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of give the, the Cliff Notes version. Um, my, my, my parents grew up in wartime England, World War II, okay, as, as children. So they experienced a lot of stuff. My Almost every woman in the Shaw line, actually going back to the, New, the Newman line from Germany, were um, automatic riders, okay, uh, which is something that, you know, you basically go into a trance, you get a feeling, and you, bas- you basically have to, like, write, you know. So... When I was three years old, I was told about that we had this family spirit guy called Old Glegley that was like a helper that would show up from time to time and help people out. And he's the one that's been communicating with the family via automatic writing for all these generations. Yeah, I'm, I'm the one that's been involved with Old Glegley. Well, so when I was three years old, I started getting visited by this being, a two-legged being that would jump on my, my chest and my stomach at you know, in the middle of the night. And I, it was kind of like playful. I thought it was like, I thought at first it like it was a cat or a dog, but then there was nothing there. It was invisible. As, <laughs> it was invisible. But I knew about Oglegley. So anyways, then fast forward to about the age of eight, uh, I was in a bunk bed and on top of the bunk bed. And I, I saw these little gnome-like, gnome-like creatures or beings about a foot tall that were walking into the room, kind of shimmery. There was four or five of them, and I looked at them, and I stared, and I, and I, I got a little bit afraid, and I, I turned over, and I, I just, you know, blanked them out of my mind. Now, when I was about, when I was 11 years old, I saw my first UFO, and this was 
a large orange globe that was going moving horizontally from south to north. And I'd say it was maybe about 500 to 1,000 feet in the air. And it just kind of stopped. I saw it at 930 at night, and then it continued going on. It was obviously it was not an airplane or a helicopter. This is 1971. I called Griffiths Park Observatory the next night. And they they had no clue about that because you know their telescopes aren't looking at you know Woodland Hills. <laughs> They're as an up example. <laughs> they just thought that I was like you know either like you know joking or whatever. And my brother, when he turned eight years old, because he was he was six years younger than me, he started sleeping in the closet in our bedroom. And I asked Philip, said, you know, why are you sleeping in the closet? And he said, well, I'm afraid of the little men that come at night. And I just happened to have, I believed him. Because he'd seen because him Because <laughs> I'd seen the same thing. And he slept in the closet for two years. Yeah. So I wasn't going to, you know, to contradict him because I'd seen the same thing. So then we fast forward again to the series of things that happened when I was 18 years old in 1979 in January. This, in, this, in, this included the whole family in two different locations, 350 miles apart. My, my mom and my brother were living in the house that we were building up in Sonora, California. It's which like is central in the, California. Yes, it's in the lower, it's in the uh, the Sierras. You know, we had a, you know, a year-round creek on, on the property and lots of trees. So anyway, the first night, uh, the, the first time the weirdisms happened, my dad came to breakfast and said, you know, Stephen, my, my door is open and closed on me. My closet door is open and closed on me last night. My dad was a, was a cop for four years in England, and he was in the RAF before that. So he was like a no-nonsense kind of guy, and he was a master cabinet maker. Anyway, so I just kind of like, you know, okay, dad, whatever. Maybe it's a dream. Right. So the next night, we my dad came into my room and said, you know, Stephen, I'm hearing these silver bells. And my being a, you know, a lifelong musician, I know what a silver bell sounds like. So I went into the living room, and sure enough, there was this silver bell being rung inside the wall by the fireplace and we just bang on the wall and look at the flu and you know we're trying to figure things out we got my sister to come in and my sister was 13 at the time she heard and, it too and she said you know what's where's that silver bell coming from so we knocked on the wall and it went on for a good 10 minutes and then it stopped now the next morning I know I gotta go fast here but no I just don't hit the mic <laughs> all right so the next the next morning the next morning we we would always call my mom and my brother because they were living in the house that we were actually physically building ourselves, you know. So, and my mom said to my dad, you know, the funny thing was, Jeffrey, that about nine o'clock last night, I heard this bell and I thought it was the phone. So I picked up the phone and there was this male voice, kind of a baritone saying, I am the invisible on Beachy. Well, this spirit guide that I've been told about that had been with the family for a long time was called Oglegly. Okay. And so anyways, I talked to my brother and my brother said, no, the phone didn't ring, but mom did pick up the phone and was speaking to somebody. So this happened exactly the same time that we 350 miles away in Southern California were hearing this bell on the wall. The very next night I went to sleep in my bedroom and I was awakened by a whizzing sound like a, about you know middle of the night and i thought well it's a bug or something like that and i, I try to go back to sleep look down the hallway try to go back to sleep and then my bed gets pushed two gentle pushes from the base of the bed and i'm thinking well oh it's a it's an earthquake you know southern california and i ignore it and then i get two more shoves and then try to ignore it still and then two much more vigorous shoves. And then I get three taps on my right deltoid, tap, 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 just like an index finger is tapping. It's like, hey, hey, hey. At this point, I'm like ticked off and scared at the same time. So I whirled over and I look, I said, what? <laughs> you know, and I can see there's something shimmery there and I can't. I can't make out a face. And then I black out. So I told my dad at breakfast time and 
we didn't know what to think. So the very next night, I decided I'm not sleeping in that bedroom. I don't know. I'm not going to sleep in the bedroom. So I went to sleep in my my work clothes in the living room. I just slept on the couch. You know, so about 5.30 in the morning, this is January, I, I, I woke up and I just looked over at the piano, thinking about piano, what music I was going to play that day, heard the fountain in the other room. And I was relaxed, but I was awake and alert, not in any type of sleep paralysis. And this being, this tall being, six and a half feet tall, blue white, intense blue white, from the front door, just kind of like noticed that I was awake and just floated, walked the 25 feet and just stopped by my right side in about, let's say, two seconds. And as soon as it stopped by my right side, the whole right side of my nervous system just was shut off. Okay. I had my right eye open and I couldn't close my right eye if I wanted to. Okay. And, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to see the family spirit guy, O'Glegley, that I heard about. So anyways, this being bent down towards my right ear and said in my ear, not in my head, said in my ear, hi, Steve. Kind of like in a, you know, you couldn't tell. It was like a male, whisper kind of. Male, you, I could not tell it was a male or female. And I'm, I'm thinking, God, I want to see your face. I want to talk to you. And But the other part of me is saying, dude, you can't move. You know, you are paralyzed. You are at its mercy. You're right? vulnerable. You're vulnerable. <laughs> And that lasted for a good, like, five, maybe ten seconds. And then the being took all the blue-white light. See, it also filled the whole room with blue-white light. Yeah, we think I think it's like a they opened a portal, maybe, and all this light flooded in from that. It wasn't just that the know. being was blue-white. It brought the whole house was filled with blue-white. Yeah. And then it left. And then I blacked out. So I told my dad at breakfast, and we're, at this point, we have no idea what is going on. So anyways, at 11.30. Now, now let, me, let me ask you this. You said your dad was no nonsense. Yes. Like, it, a, what's it, all this then kind of cop guy, you know? <laughs> so, how is your, so how is your dad okay with automatic writing, a spirit guide, and now all this spirit? Like, what is he, what is he saying? Is he just like. My, my, dad, my dad my dad, and my mom met when they were 13 or 14 years of age. Mm-hmm. They had a seven-year courtship. My dad uh, knew my grandma and my granddad very, very well. He knew and about the family. He knew thing, about you know? all this stuff. You know, he was, yeah. you know, he, he questioned it, of course. But, but he accepted it. But he Could had be. seen things himself. He had seen oh, okay. my mom and my grandma do things that he could not explain. Okay, oh, okay, so so he no yeah. he you know grew up in uh, northern England, Manchester, and Oldham, and so he had seen some pretty bizarre things. And as, Irene, his mother, uh, she was contacted three different times about family members who had died in England, and she was contacted in, in advance by with a a, this two, automatic writing a day or two before before we official got word you know would arrive. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, he mean, knew about that too. <laughs> so he, I, he, I saw, he couldn't argue. I saw it with my own eyes. Saw it with my own eyes. My mom picked me up from school when I was nine years old, and she was absolutely in tears. And I said, "Mommy, what's wrong?" Said my. She said, "My mom just died. She fell down some stairs." And I said, "Well, well, mom's in. She's in England, right?" Said, "Well, I got contacted. I went into a trance, and I was told that she that she died." And she she knew she knew twenty four hours before you even got even got contacted. Yes. So this is something that. Something that I just grew up with. I just accepted it as being this is the Shaw family. This is, you know, I didn't talk to I didn't talk to people about this type of stuff. They would think I was either crazy, lying, or that I was in the haunted house. The family were fairly you know, reticent by nature. Anyway, really talk about it was hard stuff. to get information out of them. In fact, I'd have to we had to kind of like extract it from them, you know, to get to, to get our uh, family history out of it. So, anyways, uh, to go back to the uh, the thing about uh, at eleven thirty. I decided to go get some lunch for my dad and I, right? So I, I reached in my right-hand side pocket and pulled out the coins that were in the pocket, see what kind of change I had. And all the coins, I kid you not, they were all magnetized, okay? These are standard American coins. 
I could pick them up by any part of the coin. With each other. Yeah. My dad could pick them up too. This is six hours after I had been had this encounter with this being. And I had a few nails in my pocket too. And of course, those were sticking to everything too. We think he was maybe abducted and exposed to some very yeah, powerful because, electromagnetic field. Because I, because I, because I was, I was, I, I lost, I, I, I blacked out after yeah. that, after the, being paralyzed. The one thing we've learned with the abduction phenomenon is that uh, well, frequently I people people black out they'll see some the, the family would see something terrifying sometimes and then black out you know it's it and then we've learned since with our research that that's that's the signature of the alien abduction well the final night the final night i decided to go back to sleep in my bedroom and i was on the lower bunk this time and my dad was the one who woke up this time and he saw this wall of blue white light that was in my bedroom because we had a hallway between both our bedrooms right and he saw this this big wall of blue white light and his being an ex-cop saying you know what's all this then i'm going to get to the bottom of this you know so he's getting out of bed going to go over and you know find out what is going on and this voice inside his head not in his ear but inside his head said jeffrey just go back to sleep everything's fine just relax Stephen's fine, and that's exactly what he did. They had this, what, whoever it was, whatever it was, had the power to put my dad back to sleep. Yeah. And you know, I have absolutely no recollection of that at all. And these I, events tend to come in clusters, you know, like a, that was Stephen's cluster of yeah, five. Yeah, you know? I was 18. My brother had him at 16. Yeah, he had a cluster of three, and this was at the Sonora House in Central California. That we were building, so it wasn't like we are inheriting a, like a haunted house. So he's looking out, his, he wakes up to these bright white lights shining in his bedroom, and his bedroom was a, a, a view over a drop-off, so this thing would have had to been floating like 40 feet in the air. And um, he woke up, stared at it for a second, tried to think, figure out what it was, and then blacks out. There and, were two of them. And then the next night, he's sleeping in bed and or laying in bed, and he hears a scrabbling sound uh, on the floor. And he reaches down to pet the, what he thinks is the cat. And instead, a hand grabs his wrist, and he, a cold hand, and he feels this thrill of adrenaline and terror, and then blacks out immediately. And then the the third night this is when we realize what we're dealing with he saw uh he woke up to a tall gray alien standing Six in his and a doorway half feet tall skinny and so this is when we somebody in the family finally gets a good look at who's doing this to us right who's doing this to the family and uh so now we know it's the tall grays and this is uh we found that over the research time that we were doing this we realized that um that's the, the abduction phenomenon follows families. It's not like just they're taking a smattering or sampling of all of humanity. What happens is, is they find a genetic line that they like that meets their criteria, whatever that is exactly. Um, and then they start harvesting that person's DNA again and again and again and again through their lives. And then they'll start taking the children and then the grandchildren. It's like they're after this specific quality of DNA. Um, and we think we have a handle on why specifically they take um, the data shows that they take about nine out of 10 people are Caucasian that they take. And um, four out of 10 have RH negative blood and uh, four out of 10 also have green eyes which both of these are mutations in the human genome. Mm -hmm. And uh, recessive traits actually is the term. So it seems to us that they're not taking, they're not taking like scientific samples. They're harvesting a product like a, a farmer has a cow that he, he has to regularly take mm -hmm. uh, sample the, the milk out of or something. And, and the family spirit guide protects the family too. And it's sort of like the farmer again, he's protects his cow and preys upon his cow for his needs, you know? Well, well, I want to ask, so, so Stephen. Yes. The spirit guide in, an, in the alien, the same thing or different? Yes. We think so. In fact, in fact, I wanted to share with you the story of my uncle who 
was married to my my mom's older sister. His name was Douglas Griffiths. Okay, and he was also in the Royal Air Force right after World War II, just a couple years older than my dad. So, anyways, he was stationed in what was Ceylon at the time, which is now Sri Lanka. Okay, okay. and uh, he was billeted in one of these multi-man tents, and you know, in a bunk, you know, whatever. And uh, he knew about the whole old Glegley thing. He'd been told about it by my, you know, my my grandmother and whatnot. So he was familiar with it. Maybe didn't completely believe it, but he was familiar with old Glegley, right? So, anyways, he was awakened in in salon in the middle of the night by this again tall, skinny male figure that was about six and a half feet tall was black and pure black to him with like a hat on and this figure said douglas happened to know his name douglas you need to get out right now there's a raiding party coming through right now and you may be killed and so he just you know automatically got out of his bunk and the figure just was gone right so he got out got out of the tent and then about a minute or two later a raiding party sure enough came through with machetes and with some guns and killed several of the officers. So he recounted the story to me a couple different times when I was like around 13, 14, whatever, a couple different times. And believe it or not, he was a, he ended up becoming a very wealthy man. Okay. Um, he became, you know, you know, in the, in banking and escrow. So anyways, his daughter, the very first car he bought her was a Triumph, a English Triumph, a white Triumph. And uh, guess what the license plate was? 007. Old Glegley. Old Glegley. Oh. <laughs> like thanking him for saving his life, you know. <laughs> I, 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 kid, I kid you not. This and is, they found so out when, when they were traveling in Tunisia, they found out Old Glegley means my friend in Tunisian. Yeah, they, they, they traveled the world several times. Yeah. And they were like in a bar in, in Tunisia and they were just having to re start recounting the story because, you know, they said the guy looked Tunisian and they said, Old Glegley? Are you kidding me? You know what O'Glegley means in our language? It means my, my friend. friend. So I don't know. I don't know what, what the connection is there, but I can just, just tell you that uh, the number of weirdisms that connect are just. There's a lot of them, believe me. Are, you know, we just talk a little bit about it in our documentary, but it's. And it's, then he's gone. Yeah. He's had so many things happen to him and nothing had happened to me. And I was like. I want to see something. I want to see a UFO. I want to, I want careful the experience which, too, careful you know? Which, and careful I was, what you're asking yeah, about. really. Yeah. I was believing him, but I could only believe it like 98%. There was a, still that tiny little kernel of doubt, you know? That I'm nuts. And, and then, <laughs> and then um, finally I did see one. In 2005, we were driving home. I was driving and he was in the shotgun and uh, it was night. We're looking through the windshield ahead of us. In, we were in Joshua Tree at night, going back to Yucca. And, um, up in front of us was a white light in the sky, and uh, about twice the size of Venus. And at first, I thought it was a plane flying into Palm Springs Airport, maybe. But yeah. it didn't have uh, any running lights. It was just a solid round white light. And it didn't behave like a plane, either. It kind of slowly was moving, and then it stopped and hovered. Uh, in front of us along the highway and we were driving towards it and I, it might have been coming towards us as well because it it started to get brighter and brighter and brighter a little larger too and larger say about twi about half the brightness of the moon and uh but then it took off north and was over the northern horizon and gone in less than a quarter of a second just supersonic speed uh, when I guess, I guess about 20,000 miles an hour. Yeah, and, we both saw it. And it didn't like ramp up to 20,000. It just instantly went at that speed, full speed takeoff. Any, the inertia would have been tremendous. It would have smashed everything against the wall in a normal plane, you know. Um, and, you know, so a white light in the sky can be many things, but not when it moves at no. 20,000 miles an hour. Then now, you know, you're looking at a real UFO. And that's about the moment I said, you know, we have all this data and we've been researching it and he's been researching it for decades. Let's let's really start researching for real and go ahead and write this book, you know. And it, about 20 years later, it happened. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> uh, so 18 years. 
so now so now you through doing your research and 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 and, and other things believe then when you guys would black out you would actually be physically or just maybe spiritually taken no physically taken physically taken yes to to where to a spaceship somewhere else yes um and and like what led to that conclusion like what you know why is that uh what you think was happening well, this is what they do. Um, we've tried to regress, Stephen, when, when, but when people regress, they have vague memories of their abductions and frequently can't remember the face of their abductors. But when they regress them, then they can remember, yes, I was taken on the spaceship. They took samples. They always take sperm from men and um, eggs from women. And uh, that's what the whole anal probe is. I think they're they're accessing the prostate directly for the sperm, which is what they're after and um sounds uh, sounds amazing yeah i mean it's it's no <laughs> fun it's it's no, terrifying for the, uh, you know, the, the people wish, involved you know for me i wish i i wish i knew whether they actually did it uh in the house or in my bed or whether they actually took me uh i just know that i had missing time and, and electromagnetic field and somehow, yeah, exactly. you know? magnetizing the coins it's it's like you know yeah, that I, didn't I, happen I have, in the living room <laughs> i i have tried i have tried to replicate that i've asked the people that are scientists and i say well that's not possible yeah they say you can't be and done say, no so no you know i don't know was i will say it was hit with plasma energy i have no idea i can just tell you that yeah. uh, it did not affect my health negatively in fact, I used to laugh. I tell people I used to laugh at running a five minute mile. Yeah, he was healthy I mean, guy. <laughs> I was, you know, I went to move by military duty. I was like one of the fastest guys there. So, I mean, you know, it's, you know, <laughs> I can just tell you that, you know, that this, this has been with the family uh, all the way from the Newmans to the Rose to the Shaws to the Griffiths for at least four generations. And it's almost always the same story. So, is, is somebody in the family? experiencing this stuff now my sister, like my sister says she's in community my sister she and her husband have this uh well she's actually doing another business right now but they have this it's called ghostly locations they're ghost hunters in northern england <laughs> so after after my mom she's a psychic too they're both they're all psychic in my, well almost all yes uh, my after after my, my my brother killed my mom with a shotgun and killed himself in yeah. 2017 just about three months after my dad died unnecessarily from cancer um my my sister felt a lot of guilt about that, you know, because she moved out of the country. But anyway, so now uh, she's taken up the mantle as far as being an. She's automatic. become a ghostwriter now. Yeah, I mean, an uses, automatic writer. She uses a spirit box, and she yeah, she claims to be in, in contact with, with old Glegley, you know, yeah, with old Glegley and and my my parents. So I, I I I tried when I was sixteen. I tried doing automatic writing, and I I did not like it. But he's just, very telepathic. Was, yeah, I, I have different. I have different talents, yeah. and I, I can. I, I'll. I'll just channel music. I'll channel like if I just. I get the feeling will come over me, and I'll just play. And I can't tell you, it happens like twenty times a day where I will think something, and he'll say it. Like a second later, I'll think it, and he'll say it. You know, and, and sometimes it, it, it'll be stuff, the words that don't even exist. Yeah, it'll be unusual. It'll be like uh, detorpifying. You know. <laughs> yeah. What's there? I said. I'm trying to detorpify, but I couldn't think of the word I was trying to think. And then he said it. You're trying to detorpify? <laughs> and I, and I, I still I still get visited by, it used to be like three knocks behind my head. Like it, yeah. like I'm trying to get sleep, it'd be like bang, bang, bang on the wall. But just about two weeks ago, I was trying to get back to sleep and I wasn't fully asleep. And I got, I got this. Like the shaving a haircut thing. No, no, it, no, it, was, it was pretty. It was three acres. Ba 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 ba. I know why it, the it was, aliens it was, wanted it was green acres. It was so. a freaking green acres thing. Ba 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 ba. And I said, you know, I, I say, who are you screwing with me? It's like you know, it's like <laughs> I, I still get this stuff to this day. I I still get. Except uh, we don't. I don't think they're physically oh, taking them oh, anymore. I gotta tell them this real quick. Okay. Okay. You know, you know, of course, your your buddy knows um, the editor of of the uh, of the documentary that right Horton. Mm-hmm. Well, well, Jeremy was the one who interviewed us, right? So they're partners. 
uh, in the, in this business. So, Jeremy Nori. So Jeremy Nori. So anyway, two days before, said I'm I'm going to interview you at your house, right? So we had met him in Big Bear, July the fourth. You know, never met him before in my life. So anyway, two days before, I had this very vivid dream where Jeremy and I were sitting at our glass table in the living room, and he was he was saying that. Oh, he has to go to like uh, uh, Arizona really soon. And uh, then he was pointing to his left shoulder and said, you know, I kind of got a lot of pain and stuff going on my left shoulder. So I told Leslie when I woke up that morning, he says, write this down. I said, when we see Jeremy, ask him these two questions. Because I do have precog sometimes, right? Precognition, right? Yeah. And she asked him these two questions. Sure enough. He was going to have to go to Arizona because he's been pulled to go to Arizona. That was his next project. And his left shoulder chest, he'd been over-exercising, and his left shoulder and chest were in a lot of pain because he had he had, he had had uh, strained them. Really, you know, it's like, why? It's like, why? It's like, it's like I was sitting down having a conversation two days before he was even there, and I was like, Absolutely spot on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, done... he does this all the time. Now, I got to be honest. You could ask me about any part of my body if it was hurting, and I'd say, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, this guy was very fit, though. And uh, hey, uh, say, yeah. what, are we saying? what do you say? I'm sorry. Not <laughs> but, you know, you could tell he was one of those really wiry, strong guys, you know. That's... And then also going to, you know, he's like, like the next stop was going to Arizona, too. Like, you know, yeah. It was the two specific things. Okay. <laughs> I did this with a person that used to live here that also saw the last UFO, most recent UFO that we saw. I I, uh, I, I saw her actual her ex-husband who turned out to be this really bad guy. And I, I sat down and talked to her about this guy. And I, said, oh, I actually that's my saw ex-husband. him. <laughs> I saw him in this dream in the car that he was driving and his voice and his size. And she was so scared of him that she literally jumped out of the car trying to kill herself to get away from this guy. And it was, it was like, it was like a, her lights went off her eyes and how do you know that? I, I just saw it in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, you know, I saw who won the 2000 election a year and a half before the 2000 election even happened. I knew who was going to win the election. And, you know, the guy wasn't even running at the time. I yeah, just, and he didn't just, even know who he was. Yeah, you know, I, you know it's like, you know, it's, it's like, you know, it's like. You know, he didn't know if Daddy Bush had a I, junior Bush. <laughs> I had no clue. But it was, it was it was as clear as day. I kid you not. Yeah. I he says Bush is going to win the 2000 election? Bush? This happens, this happens every But he doesn't look like Bush. It, does, it happens to me sometimes. It's yeah. like. I do have different gifts than other people have. I can I, write beautiful music. I can testify to this. Now, can we get onto our theory a little, you think? Sure, or, whatever, whatever all right. else. <laughs> okay, so we start researching, and UFO theories and UFO facts were not in alignment. It seemed like every time I tried to, like, um, First of all, we were looking at the possible theory that these creatures are coming here from all different star systems. There's a lot of people believe this, right? I've always found it strange that they're always a bipedal hominids. Even the weirdest of the aliens are always with the same skeletal structure as we have, right? And um, But I could never make the, the data fit that theory. It just kept, like... Uh, not aligning. Like I say, for instance, they're seen 10,000 times a year worldwide every year. And we know that reporting is only about 10%. So really, they're being seen 100,000 times a year. And uh, so just the numbers alone, we're starting to strain credulity that they're all coming here from these distant star systems. And then we had um, a lot of data from people who said they would see the, more than one type together in their abductions. The short grays are working with the tall grays. The tall grays are working with the reptiloids. The Nordics are working with the little grays. So they're obviously in cahoots with each other and not probably coming here from distant star systems, right? And 
Um, Stephen had this diary of Admiral Byrd's uh, account of meeting with the Ariani people under the ice sheet of Antarctica. I think most people have heard about this diary. Mm-hmm. But what most people haven't heard of is Operation High Jump, um, what happened to Operation High Jump. Uh, Admiral Byrd, well, let me back up. Uh, in the late 1930s, Hitler was showing this bizarre interest in Antarctica. His U-boats were calming the coast, and um, finally one of his U-boat captains was quoted as saying he had discovered a paradise under the ice sheet. For the Fuhrer. For the Fuhrer and the homeland and all that, right? And um, then uh, Fuhrer, the Fuhrer and the homeland start sending enormous resources to the Antarctica Queen, ships Queen and Maud's mining Queen equipment. Maud's yeah, the Queen Maud Land Coast. And... Um, engineers and mining equipment, all this resources. As he's preparing for war, mind you, he's he's expending all these resources down in Antarctica. And so after the war, uh, U.S. intelligence surmised that there's a base, a Nazi base under the ice sheet, right? And um, they send Admiral Byrd and his armada, and we believe he was tasked with the destruction of this base. But when he gets there, um, there's a Russian intelligence report that was made into a documentary, and that's where we come by this information. It's on YouTube if you ever want to look it up. This Russian documentary talks about how Operation High Jump was attacked by flying saucers that came up out of the ocean, shot some rays at the ships and the aircraft. They sank a destroyer, downed half of Admiral Byrd's carrier based aircraft, and killed dozens of men. Then what I surmise, and then they ran, they turned tail and ran back to Argentina. Where they did an interview. And Bird was quoted as saying, um, America can now be attacked by an enemy that can fly from pole to pole uh, in, in a matter of minutes or right. moments, you know. So this is what Bird was saying to the Argentine press. But then he gets back to Washington and is debriefed and muzzled. You know, he never says another word about it the rest of his life. But this diary then was discovered uh, posthumously. His son found it amongst his personal effects. And this diary uh, talks about this meeting with these men, humans, living under the ice sheet, right? And as soon as we applied these two stories to our UFO data, everything started making sense. Um, In that we believe that the people flying the UFOs in our skies are a breakaway branch of humanity. They are a breakaway branch of the Caucasian race. And that's why they are taking almost entirely Caucasians. Uh, That's why they can breed with us. They have this bizarre alien hybrid breeding program, right? Well, they shouldn't be able to breed with us, right? You know, without genetic manipulation. But they're they're actually breeding with and us they, just with sex. And they can communicate with us too, also telepathically, telepathically. same brains. So we think they have must, must be similar brains, maybe too. And so many things just click together like that. Why are these seen? I have read thousands of reports where UFOs are coming up out of lakes or <clears throat> up out of the ocean or mm-hmm. up out of yeah. the volcano or up out of a mountain or a ridge or a mesa or you know they they're coming from the earth not from up down they're coming from down up right and uh Mm -hmm. we started to look in our past and this is something i brought to the relationship i have a a minor in um ancient art history and while i was studying that in college i read this book by a man named fraser who published in uh, the 1800s He had hunted down 500 separate flood myths from 500 separate cultures all around the world. And um, since that time, a a bunch more have been discovered. There's something like almost 1,200 of them now. Yeah, Hancock. So there are 1,200 separate cultures all around the world that have a flood myth in their most ancient lore. And they're, they're, it's like 1,200 Noahs, 1,200 separate Noah stories, you know. So I started thinking, well, maybe the Great Flood really did happen. And I was looking at data from the 13,000 years ago. We had a a minor extinction event in North America where we lost, uh, within within a few centuries, uh, uh, the mammoth died out, the mastodon, 
the saber tooth cat, the dire people, wolf, the Clovis people were camel. wiped out, the American camel and horse, the stilt bear, a bunch of animals. We lost a bunch of large Within a short period of time. Uh, and always and most of them were prairie animals. And so uh, we surmised that maybe there was an enormous the great flood really did happen and wiped out these animals then. And sure enough, um, at, fir at first we thought it was the Hiawatha asteroid impact, but it turned out not to be. But there, we knew it was a celestial impact event of some kind. Layers of soil from that era have nano diamonds, uh, lots and lots of nano diamonds in them. And nano diamonds only form during celestial impacts. Um, a meteor or whatever comes into our, ast our atmosphere and brings dust particles with it. And these dust particles superheat and form these tiny little perfect round diamonds called nano diamonds. So now we knew we were looking at a celestial impact event of some kind. And since then, the younger Dryas comet has been confirmed uh, to have hit uh, 12,850 years ago. So right on the correct the timeline. Superior, what's now the Lake Superior area. Yeah. Area. And so uh, we think that it was kind of like the Deep Impact movie. And we think this is the cause of the separation of the human race. It was like, you know, in Deep Impact, uh, there's plan A is to send the Hollywood heroes into space to blow up the asteroid, right? But plan B was to sink these deep underground bunkers, cities. Uh, they call them arcs in the movie. And mm -hmm. we think that that is precisely what happened. All these flood myths, almost all of them start with some warning. God warning the people or some other entity warning the people that a, a huge flood is coming. Uh, you'd better build an ark or go to high ground or dig in underground. Um, and, you know, in order to survive, right? The haves and have nots. So we think somebody on this planet 13,000 years ago ish uh, spotted this comet coming. And we know that uh, the ancient Sumerians had very advanced astronomy. Uh, something we kind of lost that mm. the Greeks had to like rediscover, you know, thousands of years later. But um, we believe that somebody who knows who uh, on the planet saw the thing coming and warned the entire planet, you know, to build an ark, go to high ground, etc. And we think that they actually did this deep impact scenario where, you know, different continents sank these underground arcs. And we think that that's who is launching these spaceships. And see, if this is true, they are 13,000 years ahead of us technologically, because when they went underground, they took their technology with them. They took their knowledge, their technology, their culture. And of the rest of us poor schmoes on the surface were almost wiped out, first of all. There was also a genetic bottleneck, too, we found, too. Yeah. Now, now that we know, the bring words we're, we're messing around with AI and you know and with, uh, genetic with CRISPR, yeah, CRISPR technology. Yeah, so we know that at that time, the uh, surface dwelling people were reduced to roughly about ten thousand surface um, yes. people. So we the the eight billion people on the planet have regenerated from about a base of about ten thousand. That's why we're so, so not we're we not diverse enough. You know, we're right. supposed to be more diverse than right, we are. Right. It but matches. It matches up perfectly. Actually. Yeah. It does. And so uh, we think that's who's launching these things in our skies. And um, we think that, you know, we got shoved back into the Stone Age and we've had to like kind of crawl back up into, you know, technology levels. Um, but one thing we know from Bird's account when he met with these people under the ice sheet was that they think of us as barbarians. They they told him, they told Bird, they said, uh, we normally want to have nothing to do with you people and your barbaric wars and stuff they refer to him as uh, my son too yeah lot, yeah always the fatherly kind of uh figure and he said but we have to do something now we have to intervene now because you've cracked the atom and remember this meeting with bird happens in 1947 february of 1947 so right after the war they knew we cracked the atom i think that's why they were following our foo fighters and with foo fighters yeah we think that Foo Fighters were. And so now, um, you know, years later, the military, uh, you know, did you watch the congressional hearings with the, the uh, pilots talking to uh, Congress about UFOs and stuff? No, that's right. 
Like, yeah, I've heard. So, yeah, I've seen. I've seen a lot of that. Yes. Well, I mean, of course, the important reveal for most people was, oh yeah, we have ships and dead alien bodies, but that isn't news to in our circle, right? No. That we know that for a long time. But what was news to me was that apparently our military is being followed by UFOs every single time we go out on maneuvers and the russians and the chinese too they're monitoring our nuclear weapons everywhere we go every time we go out and so this points again to residency right like if they're coming from arcturus or whatever who cares if we blow ourselves up right yeah. but if they live here they have all kind of motivations for caring right and that's also like, why would aliens from another star system care about Caucasian versus or African American you know. or Hispanic races, right? You know, but a branch of humanity that happens to be Caucasian would have all kinds of uses for genetic well, it's, material it's, from it's, us, you know? It's funny you say that, is I just, I cannot remember where I heard that, but just a couple of weeks ago, I heard somebody say, isn't it funny that every interaction somebody has with an alien the aliens always telling them you have to take care of the planet you have to do this not you have to take care of yourselves yep you to, that's that message almost every time you have to take care of the planet you have to yep. make sure not they don't care what we do our to our <laughs> to each other but they don't want us to hurt the planet no matter what right you know it, it's the funny thing is mo most people don't have any clue about how many nuclear detonations that we know of that have happened since 1945 just take a wild guess how many nuclear detonations there have been since 1945 you mean so, so you're talking about the test the test don't yeah a, don't make a guess it's late at night where 2000, it's <laughs> over 2000 yeah oh my it's gosh like, you know, we, you know, we know that the nuclear bombs work right yeah you know the hydrogen yeah. bombs are we have to keep Why on, do we okay, keep we'll testing do, it? We'll do air, we'll, let's do an air blast this time. Let's do a let's do a subsurface <laughs> blast. Let's do an ocean blast. Yeah, we know they work. You know, if, you know, if you, if you have you know a, you know a breakaway branch of of humanity living here, uh, subsurface because it's actually a safer place to live than being on the surface. Don't you think that would like you know worry them a little bit? <laughs> you know, you're you're messing with you know, especially if the government from what we're led to believe has known since yes. the 40s at yes, least yeah there yeah. was a crash um you know spaceships that's another thing um why do spaceships crash if they're so technologically advanced right well i think they had to kind of quickly pull them out of mothballs or make them and start fall because they weren't expecting us to crack the atom you know obviously right and yeah. so suddenly they have to pull all these ships out of mothballs and 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 start flying them around. So and, we think that's why they're crashing. And according, <laughs> according to Richard Dolan, too, because we just were at, you know, contact in the desert. Uh, according to Dolan, within like the past hundred years, there have been over 120. I had no, no clue about this, yeah. but about 120 verified um, UFO crashes. I found a few. So and, many of them that we don't know about. I found like 20 or 30 that I put into the book, but yeah, he knew, he knew about yeah, more. Yeah, we're not talking about the USA, we're talking about all around the world. But um, okay. we know of one in um, 1941. And this one, they, there was no leak to the press, and so it didn't become a media circus. This time, they, they scooped everything up and took it off to Wright Kate Patterson. <laughs> Cape, uh, it's called a Gerardo, I believe Gerardo. is how they pronounce it. Oh, Cape, Ger Cape Gerardo. Gerardo, Missouri. Missouri, yeah. They were there. So we don't know when for sure they, they became aware of them, but we know by then they sure did. <laughs> they had one, right? You know, so, so 1941 is when we know our government, at least by then, knew about them. And um, we credit the, um, the underground ufology talk about eisenhower actually meeting with them we think and and he met with the nordics that's kind of another interesting thing whenever uh, there's a meeting it's the nordic aliens and the nordics guess what they look identical to humans they're indistinguishable from scandinavian humans right right and and valiant thor who stayed at the pentagon for three years after landing a spaceship in virginia he's a red-haired human man here and i think these other types of aliens and cryptids 
are things that they're breeding as workers. And like like the uh, the grays, I kind of always thought that grays looked like human beings that had been underground for too long, you know, like 13,000 years. <laughs> That's why their eyes are blacker and bigger and they're bald. And or, they, or, they, or they also could have been like an indigenous race that we discovered when we went underground and right. have been actually here longer than we are. So either... Either the Nordics have engineered these things from scratch, or I think they might have discovered the greys at some point uh, that were an underground civilization. Um, and maybe they have used them to then engineer these races. And we think they've engineered. Uh, it's like uh, they use genetic engineering like we would use any tool. Like building blocks or Django. You know? Yeah, they're not afraid of it like we are. Right. So we think that. They breed the greys to do work and uh, they, the reptiloids, maybe they bred them to do some underwater work. And maybe uh, we think they bred Bigfoots and utilized them as sentries. Guarding the entrances to their mm. underground and do heavy lifting and things like that. Yeah, and strong. When you need somebody strong, boy, <laughs> we, we <laughs> know tear your arms off. We, we <laughs> know that Gigantopithecus, uh, uh, that the last samples we know of Gigantopithecus, which was a ten foot tall um, primate, died out in China around three hundred thousand years ago, and that segues right in with the whole thing with the Anunnaki. Yeah, the Anunnaki so, were supposed to hear. 300,000 years ago. 450, but yeah. Right. Well, uh, according to Sitchin, and you know, we don't want to be called Sitchin clones. We we don't believe every single word that he ever wrote, but nor do we want to throw out his 50 years of, of research and his 10 books either, you know. But one of the things Sitchin said about it was he said, you know, the Anunnaki were here. They're, they are aliens from a different planet. They come here. And they uplifted humanity from Homo erectus to Homo sapien. And if this is true, this makes some sense because there's a there's the, uh, the missing link right there. There's a there's more than one missing link, but this is one of the big ones. And Homo erectus to Homo sapien, this difference happened very quickly in a in a um, evolutionary type of you know timeline. It was uh, actually, quickly. Yeah, and actually, Jason Martell at one of the seminars I went to. He presented a lot of information. And one of the things that really kind of blew my mind was showing that it looks like the neocortex of the human brain, which is the newest part, uh, was actually manipulated about 300,000 years ago. It looked like there was a cut and paste job Like done, a CRISPR editing done Basically on giving it. us the ability to speak. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so this this is stuff that is actually confirmable stuff. And right. it's, it's like, you know, it just blew my mind. I said, well, that makes more sense. It really fits in with our theory. And this is Jason Martell talking about this, and he, he showed he showed the stuff. So he, if that theory is correct, then all of us are alien because they used a little of their own DNA to to uplift us, right? Right, exactly. So that means we're all you know part alien, right? You know? <laughs> uh, but it, and that's if that's true, and I wouldn't have believed it. I would have thought, oh, it's just a you know, it's just mythology, right, or backstories or whatever. But but then this there's this hard genetic evidence. And there's another little hard kernel of evidence I particularly like that points oh. to our theories being correct. Hair of the Alien. The Hair of the Alien. It's a book written by this guy in Australia who, uh, he was, uh, he woke in bed. By the way, I'm very jealous of this guy. <laughs> Stop. He, he woke in bed with a woman straddling him, having sex with him. And she, uh, he said she looked like a hybrid being. Her eyes were abnormally large and her her cheeks were kind of pointy and her chin was kind of pointy. And there was another woman in on the bed and the foot of the bed sitting and that she looked more Asian. But the, these two women, they have sex with him. And then while he's paralyzed and can't move, then the next morning he wakes up and finds this white hair. The, the, the one he, he was first described had long white hair. He finds this white hair in his bed and he gets it analyzed, right? And it's a um, it, it's a type of hair never before, before seen in human beings. It's uh, clear, like fishing line. And there's no such thing as a clear human hair type that we know of, right? 
But then the thing genetically tests out as human, but bizarre human. It was like a Gaelic and Basque and part Chinese, you know, just a strange, you know, genetic, you know, uh, profile. Amalgam. So we're dealing with humans, but mutants. It's a mutant mutated kind of hair there's no such thing as this kind of hair so these are actually humans but mutated humans like they've been underground a little too long maybe you know well i'm gonna i'm gonna add that steven might be jealous but i think maybe once or twice when he's blacked out he's probably got a better story yeah, he that. might have uh, some <laughs> alien children of his own, his hybrid children. I, 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 I actually joke, but I, I actually, you know, I'm not a father, but do I know that I'm not a father? We don't I, know I, for I sure. Don't know. <laughs> I don't know for sure. Holy smokes. Yep. Well, so, I mean, it's obvious, you, I mean, this is crazy amount of research you guys have done on this. So this is all in the book. So how did the documentary come into play then? Well, you know, the funny, it's thing kind about, of funny, yeah. the funny, funny thing about that, uh, July the 4th of this year, we went to Big Bear to do a, um, a, fair. a, fe- a festival. You know, right? we, we have a booth where we sell the book and stuff, you know. And we, we, we'd only sold one. We went up there and, you know. It was a complete bust was, almost, yeah, we, you know. We sold, we sold one book, okay. <laughs> and people were like, kind of laughing at us. Yeah, yeah, for like a whole day in, in, endeavor and now having to like, you know, rent a, you know, motel room for a couple of days. And it was just. Yeah. It was basically, you know, we spent five hundred dollars to sell one book, right? Right. <laughs> but toward the end of the day, this guy, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Nori. Nori, came by just just about an hour before we were going to be closing up, and uh, he heard us heard me talking to this other guy and was intrigued, and we got this whole. Um, he wanted to do a documentary. He wanted about to do it. a documentary. Yeah. It was, so it turned out to be the best, not, 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 not only was it not the worst event we ever did, it was one of the best ones we ever did because of it, that. That's how it turned out, right? Yeah. I find that a lot. We, we did contact in the desert. Um, and we, I think we broke even, we sold about the even a number of books. Well, yeah. Except roughly. for the food bill at the fancy, uh, hotel. But, um, the, uh, what we got from that was we got like five business cards for podcasts and, we realized podcasts are a great a great way to reach out. We hadn't done one mm-hmm. yet before that, so that was uh, sort of led us into the the, the podcast world. And, yeah, we've we've you know. definitely paid our dues. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, yeah. so how um how do you feel the reaction? Because I know the the documentary you said it's been out about ten ten days. Mm-hmm. Yes, ten days. How has the reaction to the documentary oh, that been? Is so that is so mixed. It's yeah. That it's like so some people mixed. think. Some people say this lady's a genius, and finally somebody's answered it. And some other people's like she's crazy, you know. Or <laughs> one just came, one just came through and said that she she bored that she was totally bored me, and a bunch of yeah. But nobody saying, else ever said that. They it, might think I'm crazy, but they never thought and me boring. A, a bunch of a bunch of others <laughs> saying this is Satan's work. This yeah, is, yeah. All uh, obviously, I'm I'm a Satan worshiper, and, of course. Uh, right? And you got the ones that come throw saying you know oh well you know they're you're, demons you're, they're trying to be scholarly but they don't know what they're talking about and you know they've got some spaces thank you finally this is starting <laughs> to make sense so we've got this what we've created is it's buzz the gambit we've and we like buzz. that yes there's people are 16, arguing on our feed you know <laughs> we've had 1600 comments yeah. since the thing launched that's 1600 comments in 10 days mm-hmm. that's all and then some of these people are commenting within the comment change change yeah they're fighting with each other you know with each other yeah <laughs> so, so we, we, we passed a lot of buzz we created sure. that yeah for sure Positive <laughs> and negative. Um, well i mean so obviously it's 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 a subject in the way you guys have approached it and um it's being presented that it's really getting people either really uncomfortable, yeah, you know, yeah, or it's making them, like you said, see the see the bigger picture a little more clear. Yeah, the, the, either the light bulb comes on, or they say, <laughs> "Oh, this is all demonic," or uh, or or that they think we're idiots. Yeah, or or and you know, it's it's like it, just just imagine it. It's, it's there. And there's know? a lot of people that um, 
are coming out and saying that Sitchin was terrible and he didn't know a thing and he was the world's worst translator and stuff. But we've we've traced a lot of this to these cu- these two guys at the uh, yes. uh, London the uh, British the British, British Museum of Archaeology and they they you know these. They have like 12 PhDs between them or whatever. And, and Sitchin was a self-taught guy. And I think a lot of it is prejudice against that. That's been proven. And, you know, it's, and you know, I wouldn't throw out 50 years of this man's life and his work just because two guys are jealous. You know, I mean. He didn't go through, according to them, he didn't go, he didn't go through the right channels of doing mm-hmm. the thesis and all the papers yeah. and that kind of stuff. It's, he the, didn't the, play the, the Brits, game, you know. The Brits are famous. I, yeah. I should know, growing up in a British family, Brits mm-hmm. are famous for having their thumbs up their asses. Yeah, and a little bit pompous, maybe, sometimes. <laughs> a little but pompous. I you think that's... Go back to an entire country, honey. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's a tale, though, that's that's been around forever in different, like in yeah. archaeology, in medicine, and, and yeah. whatever, where somebody has come up with a theory or an idea and it gets dismissed because they may not be as quote unquote educated as right. as the experts yeah you know the the whole the whole crap you know with uh with the uh the great pyramids you know e- even to this day yeah, they're still they're saying still their tombs sta- saying that you know this, how it was built and they're, they're, they're not they're tombs. not pretty tombs. <laughs> It's not burial tombs. You know, I studied the Egyptians a lot in my ancient art history uh, uh, minor, right? And the the psychology of the ancient Egyptians, they were terrified of having their tombs discovered. That's why they went to enormous pains to hide them, right? They would, uh, you know... Yeah, the, Valley of the Kings. And, 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 you know, and they the first dynasty, they would kill the workers to make sure that nobody knew where these t- these tombs were, right? But um, so the idea of burying yourself in the world's most uh, obvious building <laughs> that's ever been, you know, most conspicuous building in the whole world, it's, it just goes dong to me. Like, wrong, Edith wrong, Jones. wrong. Edith Jones. Edith Jones. Yeah. Edith Jones. Get it here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Hi, I'm buried here. Come steal all my gold, you know, and stuff, right? <laughs> it makes no sense. No, Absolutely and and no we sense. really like this theory of Christopher Dunn's. Have you heard about it? It's the uh, it's called mm-hmm. the uh, the pyramid power plants. He, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I love he, he this theory. The more I read that. about it, I said, oh yeah, I think this guy is right, and that's why I think every time they went to a new location, these ancient builders, you know, the mm-hmm. megalithic structure builders. They would go to a new area, set up a pyramid for a power source, and then build the rest of the city around it. Power and communication. Yeah. They're always starting with the pyramid first. Yeah. That's the last thing you would do if it was a tomb. Exactly. (laughs) That would be the last thing you'd work on, right? Well, I'll tell you what. I think think, uh, our listeners are just probably had their minds blown with all the information <laughs> and you're getting tired too. Yeah. Well, I've, I've been tired. What are you talking about? But, uh, <laughs> but, Can uh, we just do some pr- shameless promotional stuff now, maybe yeah. send people. Yeah, to things, I, do. You know? I do. I want you to tell everybody where they <laughs> can get the book and go watch it. The uh, documentary. All right. It's um, who they are. And what they're up to by Leslie and Stephen Shaw, and you'll find it on Amazon under that. Okay. It's also available on Ingram. Uh, bookstores prefer Ingram, so it's there for bookstores. And we have a website, who they are book.com. And our Instagram is very active. I'm trying to like uh, make it a forum for people to share their stories. And we have all, all of our history and stories are, are in series is there. And that's at leslie.shaw.author. And Leslie is the L-E-S-L-I-E spelling. And uh, we are on Facebook at the same handle. And we are, we're going to be at, uh, giving a presentation in 29 Palms at the 29 Palms Book Festival on November 8th for anybody in, uh, in, that, in this quadrant of the country who want, might want to come. And uh, that's about it, right? And then our documentary is Who They oh, Are. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yes, and it's on, it's on YouTube. And we've had uh, 290,000 mm-hmm. views so far. And I, it came up immediately. I just typed who they are, and there there it was. So it's easy to find. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. I mean, I 
I did not get a chance to sit down and get and watch it before we talked, but I am definitely going to go and check it out. And uh, I will uh, let you guys know what I think. Maybe I'll get in the comments and argue with somebody. Oh, please and, do. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good, bad, or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's 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 creating buzz, Just and that's part of the whole thing. You know? <laughs> but I would, uh, I I think, um, I think this is a great information, and you know, I mean, it's it's if you don't have an open mind about some of this stuff because we know we're being visited we know they're coming from somewhere okay right. and you're 10, not the thousand first. times a year <laughs> yeah and that's incre- and i don't think people realize that there's so many there's i mean let's be honest everybody's worried about you know paying for the groceries what do they care right, if, right. if somebody's so if it doesn't happen to them, yeah, then sometimes it's not happening. But to the people that it's happening to, it's obviously, I mean, I've talked to people, plenty of people who have feel they've been abducted and have had ex- these experiences. And it's very unnerving, you know, yes. and it's that's um, the least of it. I mean, it causes PTSD in people. We think that's what killed his brother eventually is he never was an emotionally stable young man. He was. He was brilliant, uh, genius, really, but he, he never had a long relationship and he was kind of a hermit and a miser and and became very paranoid later in life. I think all of this can be laid at the feet of this early trauma uh, that he experienced as a child. Who wouldn't be paranoid if every time they turned around, they didn't know if they were going to be abducted? With an alien in your face, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> absolutely. So. Yeah. Well, I'm going to encourage everybody to go check out your book, check out the uh, documentary. And um, I'm just glad that we got to, we got to, got to do this. You guys are <laughs> wonderful. And I would I, I hope that I get to a conference or something that you guys are at someday and get to meet you guys in person. That would be so nice. Yeah, I want the, of our goal too. So I, yeah. I, I want to. I want to get some of this energy that you guys. That you guys. <laughs> we do. We do have it. That's yeah. For sure. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone out there in the in thanks. listener land for tuning in. Thank you to your audience. Yes. 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 Well, thank you guys. Thank you. And stay and stay safe. And let me give the. You too. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> or, uh, there you go. Live long and prosper, everybody. You have to hold it up for the camera up there. Oh, uh, there you go. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Bye. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the From the Shadows podcast. Until next time, never shy away from the darkness or what may be lurking in the shadows. We are out. Ha 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 ha.